Well, first of all, my talk today is about uh, what influences philanthropists. Uh, I am, well, uh, in fact, that's me. It was only a few years ago. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a British entrepreneur um, and a philanthropist. I, own, uh, I run the Greg Secker Foundation, which is uh, eight years old. Um, eight years old last week, I think. And, um, and I guess what led me into uh, this kind of work um, kind of predates me in that my grandmother, my father's uh, mother, was a, an orphan with, uh, with, with Dr. Bernardo's back in the day. Uh, which then became Bernardo's. So I, I, I kind of made this commitment to my father. I said, um, if you send me to university, because I was the only cousin out of 13 that went to university. But I said, if you went to university and I work hard, I said, I'll, I'll try and make a commitment to Bernardo's. And in my first year of business, I got, I got quite lucky. It was kind of a bit right place at the right time. And I, made, I, I did quite well. And, and I gave half of the money I made to Bernardo's in my first year. In fact, we built the uh, Bernardo's Works facility out in Stepney Green which provides um, essential training to um, youths that don't really like the academic system and, uh, and want to learn more practical skills such as uh, woodwork and, uh, and plumbing so that they don't end up selling drugs and things like that, but they actually can become corgi registered and probably work for Pimlico plumbers, ripping off most of people in London, I should imagine. But <laughs> nonetheless, um, it gave them a fantastic opportunity and it was my first kind of endeavour in it, and it gave me the opportunity to be a part of it, which was the important part. So today's talk is about what does influence uh, philanthropists? Why do we give back? And, uh, and why do my, all my organisations give over 10% of our net profits, um, which I think compares to about 1% across the FTSE at the moment, um, to giving back? And, and, and I think the, the, the number one reason is because it feels good. So uh, here's a, a few images of the things we've been doing over the last few years. seeing um, a series of images there, but I'm, I'm known as the guy that built the village in the Philippines, so I don't know whether you've heard of that project or not, but I'll, I'll tell you about it as we get into this. So, it, you know, in all of our businesses in marketing, we talk about most clients and our people who are tuned into one radio station alone, and we call that WIIFM, or what's in it for me. Um, and, and we think that this is a really important thing to think about when you're trying to attract donors to your charity, rather than pushing the agenda of why your charity needs such critical funding, um, to remember that all human beings are human beings, and most of us are, are self-concerned and put ourselves first and foremost, and tend to do things that feels good to us. And so we remembered this in our business world, and we made a decision that that's how we should think about um, our charity world. And so um, we think that people don't really make decisions. We, we know in the, in the marketing world that... You know, there's two creatures, urban and lurban. Urban is the emotional reason to buy now, and lurban is the logical reason to buy now. And we feel that most people buy things emotionally, and then they tend to back it up um, with logic. And so um, we, we did a lot of thinking about this, and we know that our lives are effectively driven by three core drivers, our values, our beliefs, and our rules. So our values are what's most important to us, the things we love doing the most. Our beliefs are what we think is possible and what we don't think is possible. And our rules tend to be um, what has to happen in order for us to feel a certain way. So for some people to feel successful, certain things have to happen. And for other people to feel depressed, certain things have to happen. And we felt that our charity work should tie its values to our businesses. And our businesses were, were really all about... Um, we, I run lots of different companies... Uh, running success summits around the world, using people like Richard Branson to motivate and, and touch, move, and inspire people. And so when I got to the stage where the business was, were doing quite well, um, my three reasons were, of course, my, my three children. And I got to the stage where I felt that business alone just simply wasn't enough, and I wanted to do, do some more. So we decided that after we supported Bernardo's, we looked at what we do in our business world, which, of course... Um, is we educate adults with critical life skills training. And we um, said, well, why don't we do that with kids? And so we set up 
the Youth Leadership Summit, where we take 2,000 kids a year from 13 to 17 years old. We put them on a, on a residential camp in the middle of nature, and we fly in different motivational speakers in the areas of health, wealth, leadership, entrepreneurship, contribution, and relationships. And these are all the, you know, all of the main um, subjects or life skills, if you will, that aren't on the national curriculum we thought would be a good idea to give kids before they screwed their lives up in their 30s and realized that they had to go on a string of seminars just to make themselves feel better. We thought, why don't we give them the, the critical life skills training early? And we've been doing that for the last eight years, and we started doing it in South Africa. And in South Africa, we've trained over 50,000 children now all over, all over the Southern Cape. And here in the UK, we take 2,000 kids. Um, and it's kind of interesting, 13 to 17 year olds aren't quite the same as they used to be when I was 13 to 17. We sort of have sort of 1,000 tents for girls and then 25 security guards and then 1,000 tents for boys as it is a week-long residential camp and we, we, don't want to make, we want to make sure that we keep the numbers to 2,000 and that doesn't, that doesn't grow. So um, that tends to be quite important. And we live, um, and certainly I've lived my life by this kind of modicum, which is learn, earn, return. Um, and in fact, we kind of run this through all of our businesses whereby we say, you know, uh, if we can discover our passion, so we... The learn part is not necessarily learning a skill so much as it is learning what you're passionate about because you're only ever going to be good at something that you're really passionate about. Um, and then learn how to monetize it. And then in your return phase, it's really doing your passion, but you're just really paying it back. Um, take my world. We, we run um, probably the largest investment education business in the world. We have 24 companies around the world running something like 125 seminars a week from here to Timbuktu. And, and that's what we do in our... In our business world, we generate enough money from that to fund our foundations. And so really in our giving back world, we're doing the same thing. We're just doing it with children and we're paying for it rather than being paid to teach at the beginning. But it's all the same thing. And the reason we, we do that is because our values are education and our values are empowerment. So why wouldn't we do that in our giving when we do that in our business? We're good at that. So rather than doing something completely different to, uh, to where our core skills are, we think that would be a mistake and we should stay where we have most leverage. We found that um, there's this bizarre karma effect whereby wherever we've gone in, we're a flexible foundation. We, uh, we kind of we break a lot of the NGO rules in that we, aren't, we don't stand for one thing. We have quite a flexible approach. So um, we started supporting the Ubuntu Education Fund in Port Elizabeth in South Africa. Um, and we made a big commitment there to build a, a, a large center and uh, in one of the poorest townships in South Africa. And that led to us opening a business, which in of itself um, became so successful that the business now runs the charity or, or supports the charity every single year in that environment. And we use the positive branding by the association of the work we do down there in our business lines. And it's a nice symbiotic effect. The same happened when we were in an earthquake in Mexico. We rebuilt one of the schools that got destroyed and unfortunately 27 children did perish. Um, but then we got amongst the community uh, we connected with our, with our fundraisers, we brought our clients out, and then suddenly we've built a business in Mexico City, of course, and as you're now going to discover, um, the same happened in the Philippines. Typhoon Haiyan swept through the Philippines on the 8th of November in 2013, um, and it was probably the largest storm to ever hit landfall. Um, we went there to um, effectively build a couple of homes, um, and we ended up building a village and uh, I'll share with you how that journey went. But because we built a village and because we were there and we were a part of it, um, we ended up building a company. And it became the most profitable company in our entire group, not led by some entrepreneurial wisdom, but just because we wanted to be out there trying to make a difference. And so what we decided to do, and what I've always decided to do, is rather than have the model whereby you make some profits and at the end of the year you cut off 5 or 10% or 3% and give it to your favorite charity, I don't believe in that model. I've I've tried to be a little bit pioneering and different and put our charity foundation in the middle of all of our companies. So if a company makes a profit or makes a loss for the month, it doesn't make a difference to its contribution to the foundation. So our businesses have to pay into our foundation every month, regardless of their financial performance. And it means that our foundation is not the rejected sibling, but very much sits shoulder to shoulder with all the other businesses in our group and is treated in the same way. And it means that we get to do lots of exciting projects and we get to work with lots of other charities and philanthropists. Um, we have lots of harebrained projects. I'm also known as the flying trader for my sins, which means that I'm a currency trader. Um, that's how I started out in my 20s. 
Um, and so I do hover over London in a helicopter, flying it and trading the currency markets whilst sending signals to traders all over the world. And whoever places a trade on those days, or the commissions of both sides of the trade go to our foundation. Um, that's a nice deal that we have with the broker, which it does mean every two hours we, build enough, we make enough money to build a home for a family of four. And in about half a day, we, build enough, uh, we make enough money to build a school for 100 kids in, in Johannesburg uh, with Virgin Unite. Um, so it's, it, it means that the charity sits quite firmly in the center of everything we do. And uh, we, we, we've decided that this would be the way we would set ourselves up. You know, if you consider um, uh, charities which don't operate in this, sorry, businesses that don't operate in this way, imagine a charity that is reliant um, on a particular sector and then there's a, uh, you know, a, an economic downturn in that sector. Uh, the Charity Commission is the first to tell you that uh, a charity that's set up that then later implodes has a worse humanitarian effect than if it was set up in the first place because so many people become reliant upon it. And so that old model we think is, 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 sh should be left where it is, in the land of being old and we think a more pioneering model. We, 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 we're trying to forge forward with, uh, we give 10% of our pre-tax profits um, and that compares to about 1% on the FTSE average. We looked at our staff and don't forget our businesses all around the world are effectively run by, by kids. So we, we, we employ, most of our employees are, are uh, younger than 30 years old. Um, and the millennials we've found uh, are a generation who are more likely to donate and feel social responsibility to charitable causes. They're going to be about 75% of our workforce very soon. Um, and we surveyed our internal staff. We employ uh, over 800 people worldwide. Uh, and they said that 81% said that they feel charity should be part of the business core. It is very intrinsic in what we do, so they are slightly influenced. Um, but 74% said they look for CSR when job hunting and 88% believe that charitable nation helps the company culture. So that's what our staff are telling us. Um, we then commissioned a report with YouGov. Um, we researched 2,000 businesses um, in and around London, and we found that 42% felt that uh, charity giving should be obligatory and, uh, and, and a bill should be passed, which is a significant change from the survey that was done uh, 10 years ago. The current model um, of giving is such that if you do well, and your business performs, you slice off some of your profits and send them to your favorite charity. But as I said earlier, if that doesn't work out, and of course um, there's a, you know, a gross economic downturn, uh, those charities can implode. And we felt that we should approach this differently. So our, our charity sits in the middle of all of our companies. We feel that the current, if you look at the current economic cycles, they are shorter, they're racier, um, there are much more boom bust cycles we've seen in the last 15 years than we've seen in the last 50. And that means that charities which are reliant on companies operating in the old model, slicing a piece of profit off if you get one, and if you don't, the first thing to get cut is a charitable donation, is perhaps an outdated model. And we feel that by putting the charity in the middle of all of our businesses, whilst it's risky, um, we think that the opportunity way outweighs the risk when you consider the benefits. Um, and I'll go through those in a second, but these are those benefits. So the benefits of centralizing giving into your business and making it business as usual, or probably for this crowd, um, how you can market your charity to a donor is the, is the, is the core message. Well, first of all, we found that um, by running, we started off doing the Youth Leadership Summit. Every Christmas we do a project called the Basket Brigade, where we pack up uh, 50 to 100 care packages for people who are living in quite desperate conditions wherever our offices and our centers are around the world. Our staff then go and give those uh, care packages to those individuals. We get those lists and names from the Salvation Army. We work quite closely with them. Um, and the idea is, is that the team get the, uh, get the sensation of giving rather than just receiving. And we notice that what's happened across our teams is it has galvanized our teams much more than uh, bonuses or, uh, or incentives. Um, they feel that they're working for an organization or a group of organizations that are more than just profit. So that was one of the major benefits for us to keeping our charity in the middle of everything that we do. Um, we've engaged all our clients. In fact, um, we've, when I first got pulled into uh, giving years ago, um, was with Sir Richard Branson on a connection trip to uh, South Africa. Um, and not only did we spend a lot of time with him doing safari and all the fun stuff, uh, he asked a group who would be willing to build a school in quite a bad neighborhood. And I was the first to put my hand up saying, I'm happy to build. I said, I'm happy to build five schools if you're prepared to 
fill the five schools up with the kids, so we instantly became friends from that. And we found that the clients that we have around the world don't just want to send checks or make direct debits, but they really want to be part of the process, and they really want to be part of the mission. I was recently invited to uh, Natalia Vodinova's Naked Heart Foundation uh, charity um, gala evening, and it was a huge fundraiser, and it was very well put together. Um, and I remember donating 25,000 pounds, I think it was, to her mission. And it was all done like a fund fair. It was quite interesting. That it wasn't called a fun fair. It was a fund fair. It was a relatively simple play on words. But nonetheless, it was all done in like a sort of a Victorian fair. And there was, if you, if you decided to pay for one of the prizes or, or donate to one of the missions, you got to spin the wheel. And the wheel had all sorts of incredible things on it, from a 250,000 pound car to some quite outrageous prizes. And when I declined to spin the wheel, everybody thought I was slightly mad because the prizes on the wheel were quite incredible. And I simply said, I, I would like to go on the mission because that's where I find out what the charity is all about. I'm not really interested in the gimmick. To which point I then meet Natalia Vodinova, who then pulls me into VIP. And as a recent apprentice to the Magic Circle, I walk into VIP and there's David Blaine and Dynamo Magician Impossible. So it all goes to show that when you get involved um, with people and kind of align with their values of what they're doing and get into the mission, it makes it a much more enjoyable process than just sending a check. So these are the, the three main benefits I want you to focus on, but there, there's a few more. Um, we felt that uh, it's very strong positive branding. 20% of people would rather do business with companies that, uh, that give back than don't at all. So it's, it's strong branding for your, for your businesses. Um, it creates incredible opportunity. Um, you're going to see a video in a minute where I built a village with my team in the Philippines. We gave 100 homes away to 583 survivors of Typhoon Haiyan. Um, and interestingly, our commitment was a sustainability one. So it wasn't just build the houses, hand them over, and get the hell out of there. It was, um, what do we do in phase two? How do we ensure that these, uh, these homes don't become derelict and, and left like they were in, in the favelas in Brazil? but actually people want to remain and stay in these communities and thrive, not just survive from there. <coughs> and, uh, and as you're going to discover, this chap I'm with in the, in the middle here, I was just having dinner with in, in the Philippines last week. Um, he's Professor Rick Patricio, and he's known as uh, the Moringa Miracle Man. So he's the guy that uh, planted all these Moringa trees in Indonesia. Um, and Moringa, if you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a green herbaceous plant where the, where the leaves are cultivated. Um, and they are an incredible health supplement. Nearly 500 million euros of, of leaves are imported into Europe every year, and that's going up to about 750 next year. So it's right at the beginning, and of course all around our village that we've just built is perfect um, climate for growing moringa trees. So the opportunity um, suddenly presented itself, whereby we'd gone in to do something useful or helpful to stabilize these people, and then of course we could create some opportunity after we met Rick Patricio, um, and actually build a, a build a business. And then we felt leaving legacy. So you'll see here, there's a, some of our staff all looking, um, you know, very workmanlike-esque with, with hats on and so on. But these are some of the directors in some of our businesses. And so we, we, we building, this is the village that we built and we're in phase two now, building a training center so we can teach them not just life skills, but a home for the social workers um, so we can really start to stabilize the community. And we name it after some of our key member of staff who have made the greatest contribution to our businesses and ultimately our, our foundation. You know, this idea of a symbiotic relationship uh, I really love and I'd like to share with you is um, the story of Nabisco. Um, as you know, Nabisco make uh, Barnum's animals, which are generally five biscuit-shaped um, uh, animals, and they did a partnership with the WWF where they actually changed the biscuits to the five most endangered species on Earth, which I thought was quite clever. Um, and they did also a deal with uh, Walmart where they were positioned um, at eye level of the average height of the shopper. Um, and it was, what was really interesting about this, they said, well, in 95, we're going to give five cents to WWF for every box of animal crackers sold. Um, but they saw a 20% increase in sales just by their association um, with the charity. Now, if you consider that in a global economic downturn, such as one where I was discussing the old model a minute ago, whereby if you have a global economic downturn, let's say, uh, in the mining sector, the first thing that's going to get cut is charitable donations. Boom. Then the charity's imploded, um, and no one's making any donations, and then the charity's over. Whereas in this model, if there was an economic downturn, um, they're hardly going to cease their relationship with the WWF because by virtue of that panda on the front of that box, they've got a 20% increase in sales. 
which vastly outweighs the contribution of five cents per box. So much so, they decided to do it again in 2010, and they saw a similar uplift. Just by thinking intelligently, how can we work with a charity um, that will also allow us to make more money, as well as have a very clever association and a very powerful message? What a great way to teach young children about which species are endangered than turn them into biscuits that they can eat. Um, so we are a different um, foundation than, than most. And, I, and when I say that, we are different. We, we don't have an identity like most do. We aren't, you know, we aren't, um, we aren't Oxfam. We aren't uh, a cancer charity. We're a charity which is quite nimble, in, in meaning that we, we look to see where we can make a, the greatest impact, both financially and non-financially. Um, of course, with our youth leadership summits, because we had access to so many gurus around the world who flow in, or call them gurus, but they are people like Deepak Chopra, Deepak Chopra Anthony Robbins, even the Wolf of Wall Street has spoken on our stage. Um, and they, they'll fly in pro bono, and they will teach uh, the kids on our residential programs for free. Um, we also look at ways that we can um, leverage and, uh, ourselves based on the, the need that's needed at the time. And of course, when Typhoon Iron hit, um, we, we took immediate action. This, this is. In 2013, Super Typhoon Haiyan hits the Philippines as the strongest storm ever recorded at landfall, devastating villages and communities, displacing over 4 million people, and causing death and destruction on a massive scale. Two years after the storm, the residents of Limerick had still not recovered from the tragedy. With limited resources, the houses destroyed by the typhoon had still not been rebuilt, and most villagers were sadly living in shanties or temporary shelters. Given the lack of progress across the region, the Greg Secker Foundation decided to step in and lend their assistance, launching the Build a House, Build a Home, Launch a Community project. With the help of local engineers and architects, the foundation created a challenging and fantastic vision to build an entire village of 100 homes with structures capable of withstanding future typhoons. One of the most important aspects of the project was community, with a particular focus on the people whose lives would be changed for the better. Greg spent time with the beneficiaries to better understand their plight and what the new village needs to be beyond just buildings in order to make a real impact on their quality of life. Construction of the project took over three years in challenging circumstances, including difficult weather conditions. As the launch approached, beneficiaries prepared for the move, most managing to move all their remaining possessions in a few plastic bags. The village was launched in January of 2018 in an emotional and spectacular display of joy, appreciation, light, and community spirit. There were inspirational speeches from Filipino world champion boxer Nonito Denair, Mrs. Earth, and the foundation's own ambassador, Angelia Ong, and a number of other dignitaries and VIPs. After the initial celebrations, Greg and his staff handed over the keys to the beneficiaries who officially took possession of their new homes, a highly anticipated ceremony which resulted in beautiful and emotionally charged moments for everybody involved. Every person who helped or volunteered on the site was also invited to sign the Monument of Gratitude, a wonderful place for future generations to learn about the origins of their village. Each person's contribution to this incredible project is recognized by a name plaque. Phase one of the Greg Secker Foundation Village is now complete, but we're not finished yet. Phase two is about reclaiming independence, building confidence, and instituting an entrepreneurial spirit. The foundation has broken ground and is now building the Quine and Matthews Training Center a fully equipped modern building where the beneficiaries and their families will be provided with a program of skills-based training to allow them to interact with global commerce and to help them become sustainable in the future. The Greg Secker Foundation is about building brighter futures. 
please help us to restore this community brick by brick and make a pledge today. You can find further details on what you can do to support this project at www.gregseckerfoundation.com. Okay, so that gives you a bit of an insight into what our village launch was like. You can kind of see the wall of gratitude at the end there, and that was all quite cleverly thought through. Some of the biggest donors did get a plaque on a wall, and some important people got their names um, on roads throughout the village. In fact, all my children's names are named after the village because I want my kids to be involved, and unless they've got something that anchors them back, they won't feel a part of it. And so we did lots of clever things to try and make people feel a part of it and want to be a part of it. Um, but the most important thing we did, of course, was share the experience with them. That's what keeps our, our donors coming back. Um, look, so here we are. We, we realise you can't teach people who are starving. We found there was three steps to recovery. One was, you know, I'm not, a const you know, I'm, I'm not in development. I'm, I have very little interest in construction. But, of course, if we don't put a roof over their heads um, and some social workers on the ground, we can't stabilise the community. So that was really step one. Uh, we engaged the Central Philippine University to help us with the skills training to make sure that we could stabilise the community and give them vital skills training. And then, really, thirdly, as you saw me talk about this Moringa Miracle Tree, um, which is what we're doing bottom right here. This is actually setting up a business where the, uh, where the workers who will effectively be working in the farms that we're developing um, will have a share of the business. So as that becomes more profitable, right, and, 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 and let's be fair, this is, a, um, you know, this is an agribusiness we're quite excited about. Um, we're not growing tobacco leaves. You know, we are, we're growing something which um, has incredible restorative health benefits from... Uh, from eliminating diabetes to regulating blood sugar levels just to improving people's overall health. So it's an exciting project from that point. And that brings us into phase two, um, which I'll give you a little clip of the video of phase two. I won't spend long on it because I realize we are quite pressed for time. Um, but phase two for us was really important. Phase two is all about making a difference. Phase two is all about empowerment. And phase two is all about perseverance, learning, and growth. I would like to introduce to you our uh, new project in our, our village. It is a livelihood project for our beneficiary here. Uh, it is called the Greg Sector Foundation Village Talipapa. Talipapa means a mini market or a retail market for, for our vendors and micro or small entrepreneurs in our village. Pila ang ginakita mo sa isa ka adlaw? 500, 800. You earn 500 to 800 pesos a day. You are hoping that uh, the small store could uh, increase your income and uh, make you stable here with us. I have shown you the different stalls we have here and we have 12 stalls all in all and uh, selling different goods. So we have all in all 29 beneficiaries or household who is being provided for livelihood in our Talipapa. It is easy for our beneficiary to access for basic goods for their household use, and for their kitchen. One of the imperative needs of the village would be sustainability. I would refer to that as the empowerment of the people to continue with their uh, livelihood and also uh, with their relationship with one another. Uh, there are so many potentials in this village because many people also have their specific skills. Moringa oleifera is now considered as God's miracle tree uh, because practically from the top to the bottom part of Moringa, every a uh, uh, part of Moringa can be used not just for uh, nutrient needs of the people but also for uh, disease control or you know it has a health benefit for some folks. We 
talk about fundraising, we talk only about money. But if we talk about uh, how people can bring in goods, even ideas, uh, and also fans as well, uh, their talents and services, this village will really be, become very, uh, you know, empowered. We do run into the, um, the Olympics, which we had a village. We've had uh, two babies born, I think two weddings, one funeral um, since January. So the, the village is thriving, but the most important thing is for us is phase two, which ensures that it becomes, a, a, you know, becomes sustainable and that they can thrive. Um, so I thought I'd share some, a few learnings that I made along the way. Um, step one was ditch the ego and don't do it the way I did. Um, and I say that kind of a little bit tongue in cheek, um, although if you're going to, if the option is don't do it or do it, of course I say do it. But there's lots of charities out there that probably do the very thing that you're thinking about doing, that have all the infrastructure set up. Um, and it is a gargantuan task to set up a foundation with all the infrastructure required and all the logistics. I think people moan a lot about um, big charities not, and the money not getting to the, to the front line, but, it, but I, I find quite the opposite to be true. Um, there's a hell of a lot of cost that goes into setting up this kind of uh, uh, foundation when there are other NGOs and charities available that can do the very thing um, that, that we've done and you could certainly integrate those into your business. Um, we felt that ensuring the project resonates with your core values is important and then embedding it into your business is a constant commitment. So all the CEOs that work in all my <laughs> businesses around the world have a, have a pledge and a commitment every month to make a certain donation to the foundation and whatever happens they do that first and they calculate their profit second. There's a big mindset shift that I think. Um, so why do we do it? Why does Warren Buffett give, what, 82% of his wealth to, um, to Bill Gates and the Bill Gates Foundation? Well, I think it really comes down to the fact that nothing feels better than knowing that you, you made a difference and your life counted. And when we look at the basic uh, three or six human needs, the bottom three of certainty, variety and significance, we all get in di through different vehicles. But those of us, they say, as this list ascends, become more spiritual in our lives. Those that are living a life of contribution are really uh, feeling and living life at a greater level. And those that uh, contribute are certainly sucking most of the juice out of life as opposed to those that are just worrying about their own needs. So the reason we, we do it and it motivates and influences us is because it feels good. You know, so my, my, I'm going to leave you with a few tips, if I can, or some, some learnings that we've had, but how to ensure one plus one equals seven. So for us, getting a funding uh, and, and getting people involved was very important. So making the contribution process fun and adventurous, do good, have fun, and the money comes was, a, was, a, was, a, was an anecdote I'll steal from Richard Branson. Um, and you can see top right there, we've got a lot of our clients, a lot of our donors involved in the groundbreaking ceremonies. We want people to be involved in it, to share that moment where either a deaf child hears for the first time or, um, or we break ground and give a family that's been destitute for the last three years a home. Um, find skilled people that can add to the charity. So Steve Ray there in the middle is um, it's actually one of our clients, one of our graduates from our investment education business in Sydney, Australia. Um, um, a very experienced structural engineer. Halfway through the project, of course, I received a phone call at four o'clock in the morning telling me that some of the houses we'd built were starting to slide down the hill. Um, because we are in a typhoon belt, and whilst the homes were typhoon resistant, well, there was some serious slope protection needed to prevent the, uh, the erosion that started to set in. So one of our clients who'd been involved in the groundbreaking ceremony then volunteered to go out and consult for free um, and help us make the village uh, uh, sustainable. It did require further investment, but because we've ha we had so many donors involved as part of the process, it then becomes an ongoing dialogue to involve them and make them feel that they are a part of the solution team, which they are. Um, and so the idea is, is that we try and integrate our donors into the process as quickly as possible. We get them into fundraising events. Um, we, we try and make it fun. We try and make it exciting. We try and introduce them to people perhaps that they haven't um, and wouldn't normally meet in their everyday lives. Um, and the last few tips, I suppose, um, we, we felt that because we had to register the charity in the Philippines um, where we were doing this project, um, it was good to have local, um, local ambassadors. So Angelia Ong here is, um, it's actually was Miss Earth three years ago. And the values of Miss Earth we felt were quite consistent um, with, our, with our foundation. Um, we felt, we feel that we should support um, charities or find donors that fit within our values, our beliefs and our rules. So we create symbiosis. So we support other charities, um, lots of other charities that have similar values to us. And we find that makes for the best mix 
And, and finally, we, we don't believe we can do it alone. So we collaborate and we have all sorts of uh, other charities on our board of our charity, which helps to give us advice and, and helps us raise money. So um, I'll probably leave you with Winston Churchill. One of my favorite quotes is, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life um, by what we give. And I'm sorry for running over, but if you have any questions, I'm all yours. Thank you. So you're somebody that's had the experience of being a donor and then has moved to setting up your own charity. Yes. Do you think that's a lot of people here will be major donor um, uh, fundraisers? And I was just wondering, has that changed your expectation of what you would expect from a fundraiser who approached you now? Um, and, and are there things you think charities could be doing better to attract major donors? Yeah, I mean, I think you've got to look at... Um, donors want to feel like they're a part of it. And I think, you know, just cutting a cheque and handing a cheque over on a stage is one thing, but there's so many more things that you can do... Um, Large donors uh, are obviously very wealthy people that are really interested in different life experiences. Um, they're not so much interested in the next object or the next gimmick. They want an experience. So um, pulling people into connection trips and missions and, and trying to really understand, you know, what is that person's top driver? What is their highest value? That's the, you know, and, and if their highest value is getting stuck in and being a part of the process, then make sure you give people an opportunity to do that. Um, brilliant. Um, has anybody else got any questions? Oh, we've got one right at the back there. Oh, that was good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I think it's good to see the um, actual connection with the ground, the work on the ground. Yeah. Uh, sometimes in the UK we're, we're a bit remote. So just one quick question for you. Do you do anything in India? Uh, not yet. Would you like <laughs> to? say not yet. Uh, I feel there's another question coming. Would you like to? <laughs> Possibly, yeah. Okay. If, it matches what, if it matches our values, we, we look at it quite seriously. Yeah, it's a yeah. school f for uh, slum children. It gives them a free education, break out of poverty. Yeah, I'm happy to talk to you about that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Pleasure. Uh, oh, we've got one couple of steps down. Thank you. Hi, it's, it's Natalie from WWF. Thank you for the mention earlier. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I just want to say I really love the business model. It's, it's really incredible. Um, and I just wondered if you had a sense of other people in the world of business doing the same thing, if, if people taking hold of that and embedding charity at the heart. Yeah, their business. that's a great question, that, and you kind of segued me on quite nicely with that one, thank you. Um, we're, we're, we're making a film about it, and I work with um, uh, a chap called uh, Bill Austin from the Starkey Hearing Foundation, who's the largest donor of... Um, he's, he's, he owns the largest private hearing aid company in the world, and he gives away the most hearing aids in the world. Um, and he has the same principle. And so we started to make a film about it that we hope to get greenlit on Netflix to try and inspire other entrepreneurs to think differently about it because we realise that, you know, whilst we've rehoused 583 people, there's millions of people in the world that need a home and the, the key is leverage. The key is, you know, so we're, this, this series, of, uh, series of films that we're making, we're hoping to get greenlit, will influence others. And funny enough, I'm in a syndicate with uh, 38 other business owners in, a, in the same business industry. Um, and I've got my fourth, my fourth foundation opened up and operating in the same way. So I've, I've managed to convince four other pals that have similar businesses that, um, that can see the benefits across their teams. You know, when you're running really quite busy businesses with young people, it's all high energy and hard late nights and hard work. Um, giving them something else other than just a pay packet bonus, but to really feel like they're a part of something. Um, we've felt that's been the glue that's kept our business as strong and robust as it has. So, um, yeah, I'm a pretty big advocate for it. Thanks. Um, thanks very much for the questions. I think that's probably um, about all we've got time for. So thanks very much to Greg. Thank you. Really interesting. Thanks for your time. Thanks.